Welcome to another community conversation here at Educause. I'm thrilled today to be joined by David Lassner, who is the president of the University of Hawaii System, but also known as a former CIO and friend of the Educause community, a well-known uh, leader in, in many fields. So um, I'm excited to have you here, David. Welcome. Thanks. Thanks, uh, John. I'm really um, grateful to be here and have this chance for the chat. And when I invited you, I did not know that you were retiring, that that had been announced. And since then, I, I read a great article about your um, presidency and your plans. 47 years at University of Hawaii? 47 years. It's the only place I've had a grown-up job. <laughs> I think, was there a picture of you in the 70s in the article? I can't I remember. I think there was, yes. yes. Wonderful. Uh, yeah, my PR people are uh, very good at digging that stuff up on me. So 11 years is a pretty long stretch for a president, right? Indeed, these days it's about, I think, pretty close to double the national average or survival rate, as we call it sometimes. Yeah. Well, when I first became a college president, my mentor took me aside and said, congratulations. And he, the first thing he said to me is, don't stay too long. <laughs> he said, he said, you'll... You'll show them all your tricks in the first six years, and and then it's time for you to move on. Now, mind you, uh, I took him out for a drink when he retired 12 years into his presidency. So so he didn't follow his own advice. And what he told me that he didn't take into consideration is that it can take you five years to get a team. And then you want to enjoy it first. Yeah, I, I mean, I, I, I think um, I agree with half of that advice, which is um, get out. Um, I, we have a former vice president here who I'm going to paraphrase the title, but, um, getting out while you're on top. Yeah. And I think knowing when you're done is really important for me. Interestingly, it's really, I'm just ready to retire. I've been yeah. at this a very long time and there are things I want to do that are not compatible with the lifestyle of being a president. And it's interesting when you get, when you get within that last decade, you start to notice people's exits and, and there's nothing better than a classy exit. Like you say, when you're, yeah. you're, you're going strong and, and stepping off stage that way is a lovely thing. So everything we've just said about, you know, the uh, survival rate and the endurance and how long you should be and when you, is, would your advice be the same for a CIO? Oh yeah, absolutely. Uh, you know, I think CIO is also, CIOs can last longer, I think, for all kinds of reasons. Um, but still, you know, if you find that the time is, you know, you're, you should know and you should have people around you who can tell you when it's time. Yeah. I have more people around me wishing I were staying. So my, I mean, there are definitely people who are glad I'm, I'm stepping down, no question. Um, and I could make that list, but many more people... Uh, are wishing me well. It's sort of sad for us and happy for you, David. Enjoy. Well, and I, I read that you are going to have a little office in IT. <laughs> That's pretty cool. Yeah. So um, it's funny when I took the job um, and, and we've had um, some difficult departures here, you know, two of the three presidents before me. Um, it, it was hard for the institution, for the individuals. Um, and I just when I took the job, I didn't want to be the source of that kind of drama for the institution. So I actually never had a contract. And um, we'll talk a little about my path, I think, but I was never a tenured faculty member. So many presidents returned to the faculty. And since I had never been on the faculty, I didn't, that wasn't an option. And when the, uh, I was kind of negotiating with the, the board about my appointment as president, they said, well, what about afterward? because they had just been through this. And I said, you know, uh, I just want to be president and emeritus so I can dabble in some projects if I want to. And we have a new IT building that uh, I was the CIO when we broke ground on it. But by the time we had the grand opening, I was president. So I never got to move into my <laughs> my baby. So I Your said, office, yeah. president emeritus with an office in the IT building. So. Well, I love the idea of, you know, uh, Returning to faculty is certainly a well-worn pathway. Uh, I kind of like the idea of you going back and doing desktop support. Wouldn't that be a summon? <laughs> <laughs> I'm David. I'm here to help you with your... <laughs> so what's funny is kind of in my first couple of years as president, that my instinct when I was in a meeting and something wasn't working was to try to fix it. 
And I had to hold back because people really don't want to see the president doing that. Yeah. Yep. Yep. Well, so you're, you know, part of, of why you were on my radar about five minutes after I started at Educause was um, a, a also as somebody who sort of has this IT background and then um, became a president myself. There's a it's a pretty small pool of people who have gone from a CIO position to a presidency. Do, does do you feel like a unicorn? <laughs> yeah the the only one I really knew of at the time was Michael McRobbie at Indiana, who you know I knew we we worked in some of the same circles. And, um, but other than that, I actually I didn't know you at the time, John. I didn't know you until you resurfaced at Educause, yeah. actually. But um, yeah, so I today I don't know any presidents who came up through yeah. this path, and and especially um, because I was never a faculty member, it's it makes it even stranger. Well, it, how did you? What, what when was that seed planted? Uh, and did did somebody encourage you along the way? Um, no, it was a complete um, unexpected path. Um, when, so I, I, I mean, it's a longer story, but I, you know, uh, came in as a contractor. I came over on a one year halftime contract from the university of Illinois. I was a graduate student working in, um, the computer based education research lab, which was the home of the Plato system for those who follow computers and teaching and learning. So my undergraduate and graduate student job was in essentially the Plato lab writing software to teach in the, this is in the seventies. And, um, the university of Hawaii wanted to get started with Plato uh, again in the seventies and they needed somebody to come out and help them get started because it's a pretty unique system. So nobody cheaper than a graduate student. So I came in 1977 on a one year halftime contract for $750 a month to help the university of Hawaii get started with Plato. And I basically never left. So um, from that entry level IT staff, IT manager, IT director, figuring out in the era of separate academic, administrative computing, telecom, all different, and putting those things together into what is now a modern IT organization. So those were all steps along my pathway, eventually becoming vice president for IT, where I was very happy. I mean, honestly, I thought I had you know, perhaps the best job in the world. I loved doing IT. I loved the excitement and what we could do for it in higher education. And um, Hawaii, I think, is the best place on earth. So I couldn't have been happier, really. My predecessor stepped down and I was one of the sitting vice presidents. And they said, we're looking for somebody, the board chair called me up and said, we're looking for somebody uh, to serve as interim president probably for a year while we do a search and we want somebody who isn't going to apply for the job. And I literally said, I'm not going to apply for the job. And by the way, I'm my third choice if I were picking. And uh, there were two other vice presidents I thought were really more qualified to, to do this. And um, they picked me anyway. And about, uh, I guess it was six, six or seven months into the search, they said, we know you didn't apply for it. And we were looking for somebody who, but can we consider you? And at that point I said, okay. And I knew enough to know that if the board wants you, that's kind of half the battle. Um, so they asked me if they could consider me and it remained a competitive process. I ended up in a pool. They had two finalists and they ended up picking me. And that was about 11 years ago. It's the serendipity, uh, is a yeah. familiar, uh, dynamic for me. Um, it, it, having said that, one of the things I admire so much about people who I might be coaching or talking to about career is is people who bring a real intentionality to it. Um, I find myself wondering, had you pursued it actively, right. <laughs> would it have gone differently? I mean, was it your, I don't need this? <laughs> um, I, I, I don't mean this to sound um, Pollyannish, but... I, I mean, I love this place and I love this university and I really felt like if the board thought I was the best president for that point in time, then I wanted to do it knowing, you know, it's, these are tough jobs and you don't always last and you can easily get, you know, chewed up and spit out. But I, you know, I, I didn't, 
need it. I wasn't seeking this, yeah. uh, but it's, you know, you, it's a public university and it's public service at some level. And I'm not complaining about it. I mean, I'm well paid and, and all of that, but um, yeah. I think there's something magical about coming from the technology ranks, um, that tactical, you know, savvy and the, and the joy of, of seeing a project from start to middle to finish that helps. Yeah. I think, um, you know, so my longevity with the institution, so I guess that would have been about 36 years here. And what is interesting, and some of it may be the time I came into IT, um, you know, I came in doing this newfangled idea that computers might be useful in teaching and learning. This was not common thinking in 1977. And we had a president um, at the time who was a um, local guy, actually, World War II vet, MIT trained engineer, uh, Japanese American. And, and he said, you know, I think this is going to be a big deal. And he was the one who asked a group of, um, of folks from UH to go check out systems like Plato and, you know, there were others around the country at the time that resulted in creating this project that, that brought me here. And as a result, uh, I, I was working with some of the most innovative people in the university and around the country, frankly, who were looking at, you know, this really interesting question. And I think that curiosity that, that I had beginning with the use of computers in teaching and learning, um, I was there you know, basically when PCs were invented, developed, and we were figuring it out. And, uh, you know, I was young and curious enough that when the traditional computer center people were busy with mainframes and mini computers and, um, um, you know, text processing and things. And I said, hey, these microcomputers are cool. Let's, we should be doing something in the computing center. And I had a boss who let me do it, a computing center director. Um, same thing happened with the internet. You know, there was no such thing when, you know, some of us gray hairs started. And so kind of identifying opportunities and seizing them, um, high performance computing. So in, in leading technology through some of these really, um, significant changes, I think, um, I was engaged throughout the university. So we're a 10 campus system with a flagship research university. We have campuses or education centers on every island. And in my first year here, I mean, if you can get this for work, I had to go to every island and I dragged these big 160 pound Plato, Plato terminals, connected them to phone lines and modems to get back, you know, all the way to the control data mainframe in Illinois to demonstrate Plato and, you know, the, really the most advanced use of computers in teaching and learning. So you can imagine who I met all yep. of these steps along the way. This is a microcomputer. This is the internet. These are the things that are going to be important over time. Um, and that's what I think helped me when I finally, you know, ended up in this job that I had so many touch points, uh, on 10 campuses around the state. And, you know, people who are interested in teaching and learning, research, you know, new information systems. You know, we were one of the first universities to implement a PeopleSoft HR system, and we did it without consultants. It was kind of legendary in the 90s to pull something like that off. Um, so, so I understood the place, I think, pretty well. Um, that said, I certainly found gaps when I became president, things I knew nothing about. And perhaps that's one thing I'd say if somebody aspires to be president, um, I pretty consciously didn't want to be president. I, I watched presidents. I thought, I have a better life than they do. Yeah. I, I really well, believe it, for example. Like, um, so there were things that I, you know, sitting in VP, you know, president cabinet meetings, um, I didn't really pay that much attention to fundraising. You know, I didn't pay that much attention to construction. I didn't pay that much attention to real estate. I didn't pay that much attention to athletics. So these are all things I really had to figure out, you know, as a president that you don't have to really think about as a CIO. Well, the trajectory of coming from a technology background to become a president seems like it would be a great strategic advantage given the way that technology has, has impacted and shaped 
um, higher education. Yeah. yeah. Do you think? Do you think, as you look as you look around at your colleague presidents around the country and around the world, that presidents are becoming more tech savvy, or is that continuing to be sort of a lagging? I I mean, there's no question that they are more tech savvy uh, than they were. Um, yeah. I, whether I, whether it's enough is the question, I suppose. Given well, I, I think that's right, and you know how how well do. Um, CIOs and the technical community do it, explaining and conveying the importance to the presidents and, you know, probably the whole cabinet to understand. Um, you know, I, I can think of one, one moment that I recall when they, they got it. And this was, um, so I also had our flagship research university. I'm a combined system campus CEO right now. And uh, we had a flood about 20 years ago uh, they cut across the campus, uh, flooded the basement of the library, and took out the power to most of campus. And so we're sitting at about, it was, it was in the night, and maybe six in the morning, I think it was a Saturday morning, we're uh, in one of the buildings that had power. And our this is before we had a new IT building. <laughs> By the way, it's one of the, the reasons we have a new IT building. Um, and we lost power to the computer center, where pretty much everything was housed. So we're, we're sitting there and people are talking about, okay, um, we got to send out a mass email to the whole campus. And I, I looked at everybody and go, well, uh, you didn't identify the computer center as a priority for a generator and we don't have any servers that can send out email to everybody. Then, okay, we got to put up a web page. Well, you didn't identify the uh, computing center as a priority. They were thinking about lab animals and yeah. you know things that are really important, uh, freezers with specimens. And the third time I said, we're not putting up any web pages with information, they said, okay, okay, the computer center is a priority. And we started ordering generators to wow. power the computing center. And, and I think that's one of the times when I watched the leadership of an entire campus get it. Um, yeah. yeah. The, uh, so when you became president, did IT report to you? Yes. So that was all. Yes. So I had, you know, on this pathway, you know, when I came into it, we had really four or so distinct IT units that reported to three different vice presidents along the way. We had traditional academic computing, traditional administrative computing. We had a telecom that did phones and we had a distance learning that did also ran a campus video network. And, um, there was a sense that IT, and again, this is something probably mostly of interest to people historic, unless you were around in the sort of late 80s into the 90s, this was pretty common. And in an EDUCOM conference or a CAUSE conference would be full of sessions about merging academic and administrative oh, yeah. computing. And then unmerging them later. Yeah. Who was going to win? Yeah. Right? And it's symbolized by the difference between the two conferences, you know, prior to the merger that created EDUCOS. And um, I was uh, first asked to lead strategic planning for IT. So I led the first, that process. And uh, it brought people together to say, not one should be in charge, but that we need one unified unit. That yeah. you, I mean, you would literally move into an office and you might have three different people show up to wire you to the academic network, the administrative network, and the coaxial uh, cable TV network. Yeah. Um, so that process led to combining creation then of our first, it was called a director position as a CIO. Then it got renamed to CIO. And then at one point when I was get, getting recruited away, um, I told a friendly president who didn't really want me to go away, um, I said, I would really like to be a vice president. And um, he made that happen the next time he was jiggering. And, and that did change the trajectory of, you know, the ways I could, I think, help and influence the institution around technology issues. Yeah, I'm trying to I'm trying to imagine whether um, having a president who was a CIO is a dream come true for the for the CIO who follows you or a total nightmare. <laughs> You know, um, yeah, we were talking before and you wondered, um, 
if it was a problem uh, for the CIO to know where the bodies were buried. Yeah. Um, yeah. I, I'm going to say it another way. So first I'll say, I, I think, you know, in our case, it's great. Um, so I did hire, you know, my replacement. Um, it was somebody I knew who's similarly committed to Hawaii and this institution and, you know, really loves the job. Garrett Yoshimi's active in a oh, sure, yeah. organizations. Um, I, I thought I wasn't going to be able to let go. I was actually pretty worried about me and I surprised myself with how easy that was. So, you know, we meet every week or two as I do with all of, you know, the, the vice presidents to review the issues and ideas in, in their portfolio. Um, and it's mostly, you know, uh, I try to help him with problems. He ends every meeting, anything I can help you with. Um, and I'm surprisingly out of his hair. He humors me when I have questions about things that I'm just curious about. And it's not so much that I'm trying to influence the direction, although certainly there are times when I worry and I share my opinions. But um, my leadership style is pretty much with, with my direct reports to tell them what I think. But I know that if I tell them exactly what to do, then I own every problem. And I do not want to overrule you know, direct reports on most decisions unless I really want to own the outcome of that. Yeah. Yeah. So I think it works. It works quite well. He is pretty happy. I think he enjoys having a boss who gets a kick out of what he's doing and it isn't in his hair. And I like to think I left him a lot of buried treasures, which I do know where they, they are. Much more positive than body. Very yeah, positive. yeah. And um, your he's happy to have me back in his building. It's his building, not my building. Yeah. Uh, he's setting aside a little office for me to go to in January, which I'm looking forward. And uh, I'll be cognizant of the fact that as an emeritus, I need to stay out of his hair. I also need to stay out of the president's hair, the next president. And um, the building is far enough away from the this this president's office building where I sit today. Um, and my projects will be mostly external facing. I'm still the PI on a few pretty big uh, projects um, that I'm looking forward to yeah. engaging a little more in. Well, so somebody, somebody who's listening to this and, you know, maybe, maybe this is planting a seed for that person. Uh, maybe I do want to be a president. What, what advice do you have for somebody from, uh, from our world, from our community who maybe is starting to think about becoming a president? Um, so I'd say you really want to, um, especially if you're trying to do it at your same institution, um, be really well-rounded and have a good understanding of the institution and all of the, um, the ways in which technology influences things that will give you an understanding of those things. So I think I have a pretty good understanding of teaching and learning. I think I have a pretty good understanding of research. I was, a um, I'm actually the top grossing PI here. Um, still, I was and still am. Um, so I understand that, you know, leading administrative systems and leading a complex, you know, at a, at a big institution, IT organizations are complicated. So, you know, I, I just knew a lot about how to run stuff that I think was well appreciated. You know, um, we know how to start projects and finish projects and, you know, adjust them. And a lot of the things we have to do as a president are, you know, similar. There's very little that gets done with a simple decision and then everything is fine. Um, and presidents have to make sure stuff gets done too. Yeah. As you're talking, I'm, I'm happily realizing that all the advice for a CIO who, or CISO or someone else who's thinking of being president is also just really good advice for technology. Right. I mean... I think that's uh, right. to do what we used to and still talk about as the integrative CIO, you know, as a CIO who understands the, the role of technology strategically and impacting the array of priorities and values. And and so being able to do that you know, may or may not get you a presidency, but it's going to make you a great technology leader. Well, uh, and I, you know, if you're doing the job at an institution, you that you really care about its success. Um, it will help you make the institution more successful too. I mean, and that's how I always looked at it as, as well as I'm just have a lot of natural curiosity about stuff I 
if I don't know about it, most things I do, I'm interested in learning more about it. Well, th throughout this entire conversation, your love and for Hawaii, for, for the university, for the system comes through, your passion for what we, I mean, and those at the end of the day are what gets you the captain's seat, <laughs> right? I mean, I think that's right. Yeah. And, and I think I'm, you know, one pe good piece of advice I got um, was from the board chair who um, ended up selecting me and uh, he was terming out as he was selecting, you know, chairing the board that selected a new president. And he said, you know, we, we hired you for who you are, David. Don't try to become a different person just because you're president. And I remind myself of that when people start trying to treat me like a president, whatever that means to them. And I think I'm, I'm the same person I was when I moved here. You know, I've grown obviously since 1977 when I moved here, but I mostly grew up here. I have plenty of friends who have seen me, you know, in situations that are very unpresidential. So I'm not going to pretend um, that I'm somebody I'm not. And I, I got a new job. I didn't turn into a new person. Yeah. There is something to that. I know that when I was um, applying for presidencies, that was always the magic was being presidential. Like, what is that? And are you supposed to suddenly have more gravitas and suddenly begin in the end? It's like you have to be authentically you. Yep. Um, and I think Absolutely. that shines through. Yeah. So um, how has Educaz um, helped you along your journey? Uh, to a president. Uh, so when I um, got started, as I mentioned earlier, it was Educom and Cause, and I went to both um, after I, you know, got involved in creating our uh, first integrated IT organization. Um, I, I'm going to say it this way: nothing. Um, I mean, there's a couple things going on for me. One is I, as I shared, I was interested in all the ways IT touches, uh, and and clearly Educause is the premier. Um, organization for IT leaders and, you know, many, many parts of our IT community as well. Um, so the, actually at the time it was the Cause Management Institute was one of the places I got started, you know, in basic management skills. And I went through, I think it was at the time the Management Institute and then the Director's Institute. And then I was, a couple of years later, I was invited onto the faculty and that was really, um, that really helped shape me, both the, the group of colleagues that I worked with on the faculty. Um, at, you know, like they say, you learn something better when you have to teach it. And, you know, we had a rotation of who taught what, you know, over the time. And then I was invited onto the, um, the Caudit Management Institute faculty, which is the group that does the similar institutes for Australia, New Zealand. I had the shortest plane ride of anybody um, getting there. Um, so some of it is the substance of what I learned. Uh, I mean, you know, I did conference presentations and things, and a lot of it is the network. And um, somewhere along the line, I was elected to the Educause board by the membership. And um, I did a, 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 I forget if it was a year or two as chair of the Educause board as well. Um, so the professional network was really important to me. And, and I'd say um, that helped me whenever we had a conversation on campus, I knew what was going on at other peer, you know, whether it was peer systems, because that's a kind of unique thing in higher education or peer campuses, you know, especially the R1 group. But I'd say it's, it's also the other, I was very engaged professionally as a CIO. So um, I was very active in, in Internet 2. We were one of the, you know, the first 65 institutions to join Internet 2. Um, for teaching and learning, the group I was closest to was actually the, the WICHE at the time. It was called W Western Cooperative for Educational Telecommunications, still WCET, but it's got a different, it's, the acronym has changed. And it's got a global focus. It's not really Western, but I was, you know, on the founding steering committee of that thing. And I just found that my experience in these professional organizations and the connections, you know, helping found the um, Kuali Consortium and a bunch of other things really helped me understand how to solve problems with colleagues. And it's something, um, it, it's one of the things when I jumped to a presidency that uh, unlike people who come up from the provost job, 
they know each other. So I, when, I meet, when I came in as a president, I knew almost no presidents. So I was left without a network. It was um, kind of startling to me. Um, and, and other presidents, when I saw the traditional pathway, and you know, they, they kind of knew each other from coming up through the ranks in different ways. Um, you know, so something to keep an eye out for, I guess. Yeah. Well, um, we'll, we'll, we'll wrap up a conversation that I'd love to continue for another couple of hours, but, um, you know, I, I think, I think you're an inspiration for our community prior to becoming a president, but we're all just so proud to see someone from our ranks, uh, take such an important leadership role. And, um, it's a pleasure to have you here and, and in your uh, next adventure in your IT office, we will be able to stay in touch, I hope. Thanks, John. Uh, it's been a lot of fun. I enjoyed talking with you. And uh, aloha, everybody.